12. We're going to read uh, verse 31 and 32. But just so you know, the verses in front of it are talking about what you seek. I think this thing's a little echoing back. There we go. What you seek. (coughs) And that the people of this world, they seek this and that and whatever. They seek... um, not just material possessions, though. I don't want to put it in that thing because that makes it sound like, well, it's just uh, it's those people out there. It's that we seek, see if I can say this correctly, it's that we seek the things that we need, like food and clothing, because that's really what it's talking about. And we seek that, even though it it may not be like seeking to take food and clothing away from other people. We're seeking food and clothing and those sorts of things. Um, We seek that. automatically we we seek it automatically because it takes care of us that's the key right there we seek it not that again not that we're seeking food and clothing to take away from someone else jesus isn't addressing selfishness to that degree he's just addressing another kingdom that is opposite of his kingdom. That in his kingdom, he he thinks of others also, if I can put it like that. And you get that in Philippians, what, um, 3 and 4. Um, I'm sorry, Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. And so, uh, he's addressing that not as this core evil that is just so rank and selfish, but it's the natural way of human beings. And he says in verse 31, but rather, but rather seek ye first the kingdom of God, which is a government that is not automatically without any thought or malice going to take care of self first. And that's why he used the word first. Seek ye first. He didn't have to use the word first. But he realizes what does that scripture say in John that he knew what was in all men. And he realizes these things. And so um, he is not Uh, trying to theologically convince us of our selfishness, the deep-rooted center that is self. He's trying to address it, I don't know, I I would say in a more humane way, in a a more genteel way. He's just saying... After all these things, clothing, food, shelter, do the Gentiles seek? And he's not saying it's evil. He's saying there's, some, there's another way that I'm trying to bring you into, and it's the kingdom of God. It is the rule, the government of the nature of Christ, which um, doesn't, 
automatically and exclusively seek its own. The kingdom of God doesn't automatically and exclusively seek its own. It doesn't. It is just like that nature that is in man, that is in the world, automatically does do that. When you say when we say exclusively, we mean usually, you know, first. We're first. You know, you ever heard the saying, well, you know, look, I gotta watch out for number one. There you have it. There's there it is in a nutshell, right there. I gotta watch out for number one. Um and uh, he's saying that the kingdom of God is similar to that. <clears throat> the kingdom of God is similar in that uh, it's not similar in its approach or nature, but it's similar in that it automatically does consider a broader picture than itself. That, that's what I mean when I say you know, similar. It's not. And so, um, <clears throat> so he, he says, but rather, you know, you you know the Gentiles seek this, and he doesn't say, and they're wicked and evil. He's just trying to impart another view that maybe they've never even considered because if something is so automatic with you that you automatically, you know, you're thinking, you know, how does this affect me or whatever, even though those thoughts don't even go through your mind anymore because it's a nature thing, you just want you just filtering everything based on. What benefit is that going to be to me? And if it's not going to be any benefit to me, then it has no use to me, which, you know, that's called pragmatism. It's not Jesus. It's not Jesus. <coughs> and so, um, so he's saying, but rather seek ye first. Some, some powerful words there, really. But, you know, whatever, whatever is true, has been true of mankind, let it not be true of you. Let you be of another kingdom. Be of another kingdom. Not just seek a kingdom to dwell in like, a again, a castle, a, a, a city. It's a big castle that you dwell there with God and the brothers and sisters. No, no, no. Seek that this kingdom be in you. So, it says that. But rather... Seek ye the first the kingdom of God. Now, it doesn't use that here in Luke, but we know that it does in the other Gospels. But, but rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. In other words, he's actually saying that the, the issue is not the things. The issue is what's first. And if we can grasp that, you know, because with it, you know, there's always this thought, well, if I follow Jesus, if I go all out for Jesus, well, I'm going to lose everything. I won't have anything, and, it, and nothing will be fun anymore, and I'll just be miserable. No. 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 He wants your heart. He wants your heart. And then, and then, believe it or not, a lot of the things that you didn't want to give up, you'll gladly give up because your heart's changed, and it won't be a challenge to you. It will be life to you. All right. But then the next verse, fear not, little flock, for it gives the it, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. All right. All right. Now that's, you know, I mean I love I love just looking at these the words of the Bible because if you just take that scripture out of context, you go, "Oh, well, fear not, little flock." Don't be afraid. He really does want to give you the kingdom. And that's okay. That's, that's true, too. But the context here is all of the people of the Gentiles, all the people of the world are seeking shelter and clothes and food and taking care of themselves and their own, meaning their family, their own, whatever that is, you know. Um, and he says, but... You should seek first the kingdom. And he says, so, so fear not. Fear not about your things and you being taken care of in this way and in that way. Now, okay, so here's how we read that. This is cr the Christian view. 
okay, so I'm not going to fear. God's going to give me all of that. So I will still get it. I still will get it all. And maybe even more. Because, so I'm not supposed to be afraid. So then we get upset and or fearful when he doesn't do that for us because we haven't actually taken into us the spirit of the kingdom. You know what I'm saying? We haven't taken into us the spirit of the kingdom of God. Um, we're, we're over in Luke chapter 12. And I'm sorry I never really got a chance to meet y'all face to face. But I'm Randy and I know your names and sure glad to have you here with us tonight. Praise God. All right, we're in Luke uh, 12, and we're looking at verse 31 and 32. Um, we're in verse 32, where he says, Fear not, little flock. Okay, so he's, he's saying that if this government gets on the inside of you, it's not going to be about sitting in the highest seat or having the best thing, or being first. It's not going to be about that anymore. It's another kind of a kingdom. It's the kingdom of the nature of Christ in us. All right. <clears throat> so, I love his wording there also uh, after that. <clears throat> Fear not, little flock. I mean, can you get any more vulnerable than being, a, you're not just a, a lamb, <laughs> you know, we're not just his sheep, we're not just his lambs, but we're a little flock, you know. Can you get any smaller? Can you get any more the least? Can you get any more like that grain of mustard seed that is the least of all seeds and yet out from it? Will come the greatest, not the greatest for us, honestly, folks, the greatest for others. <clears throat> and so he says, don't be afraid, little flock. And why would he say that? Why would he say that in that manner? Why wouldn't he say, fear not, kingdom warrior? the knights of the cross-shaped table. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> as long as we're knights, you know, as long as we're charging the enemy and whatever. <clears throat> but the little flock of Israel always has to do, especially the little flock of Israel, has to do with that which is going to be offered up in sacrifice in the temple and represents Christ, and represents Christ in his selflessness. It represents Jesus in his self-giving. It, um, it represents him, you know, the whole point of, of the sacrifice was that it had to be a willing, a willing sacrifice. All right, well, that's why so many Christians, when confronted with what these scriptures really mean, want to run away because they don't want to lose anything and yet Jesus lost everything for us. I mean he did and, and I mean he was God and he became man. He was man. He became a servant. We're just quoting Philippians 2 now. He was a servant and then he became obedient unto death as a criminal. He didn't do it for his own health. He did it because he loves us. He did it because it's also his nature because God is love. So when it says he loves us, I, I love one translation of the last part of Galatians 2.20. The first part is, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. But then the last part is, and the life that I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves by giving himself for me. Wow. See, I mean, we can, we can sit back and admire that. We can look at the cross. We can look at Jesus hanging there. We can, we can say, oh, how beautiful and everything. 
But if it's just saved us so that we can continue to be selfish and self-centered, if we just uh, if we're just embracing it in that same wrong kingdom that says, "Yeah, I'll embrace you, Jesus, to save my neck. I'll embrace you. You know, I'm so glad you took my punishment because I sure don't want to go through anything. You know, I mean, what kind of you know? And yet Jesus says. You know, we would, this is the way our mind rolls, we would say, well, you know, we'd take the next step forward and we'd say, well, you did all this for me, so I'm going to do it for you. And yet Jesus in 1 John 3.16 says, by this perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and here's what the Lord says, and we are to lay down our lives for the brethren. See, I mean... Well, the brethren never, you know what I mean? They didn't die for me. You know, they're, they, you know, the brethren are mean, some of them. You know, well, I mean, they're, you know, I mean, you can get hurt in the house of God. Um, and if, you, if it hadn't happened to you yet, just hang around. It doesn't matter, you, you know, it can be this one, it can be any of them. And it's almost guaranteed to happen because the only way to prove that you're in the kingdom, the only way that you, to prove that you're governed by the nature of Christ is to be put in a situation that is contrary to your liking and you lay down your life by Christ for them, by this perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought. Do we? I don't know, but we ought. <laughs> we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. All right. So, <clears throat> so Jesus is, is expressing that in, in, really, I feel most tender terms when he's saying, you know, the, all the Gentiles, they seek after their own house, their own clothes, their own food, their own keeping, their own this and that. And he says, but rather you seek the kingdom of God. You seek to be different than automatically putting yourself first. <coughs> um, I drew something like this in the last class, maybe a little bit different. I think I'll leave that there and I'll try to talk into it. Um, so this circle represents us in the world, right, right here, just us. We're Christians, but in this case, I'm going to call us sheep. And then over here, I'm going to draw the sheepfold. Okay. The work of God is twofold. When in relationship to the kingdom, and we mentioned this last class, but I'd like to get this clear to us um, that. God is first and foremost trying to get the kingdom formed in us by nature, by life. Once that is done, then he brings us all, and we'll, we'll see that even in the scriptures we're going to go through tonight. He brings all the sheep into this sheepfold called the kingdom. We are not the middle flock. It gives the Father good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do you see that? gives him good pleasure to give you the kingdom but first he wants to form that kingdom in you all right <clears throat> now one of the things we're going to see is that the the qualifications for entering the kingdom is to be conformed to the king you go that doesn't make sense it does because he is not going to bring in to um his greater kingdom goats. So he divides, you're familiar with the scripture, he divides the sheep from the goats. And so, and, and then he says, you know, enter in. You know, enter in once that's done. He says, you know, they on the right hand, all the sheep, enter in then. Okay. Well, that's because when they stood before him, they were already. Governed. They were already 
sheep. They were already lambs. They were already selfless. They were already being conformed to the image of Christ, which, which, by the way, is greater than even just being a Christian. Being conformed to the image of Christ is greater than just being a Christian. Because when the Father looks, he doesn't just look and see a good person. He doesn't just see a Christian person. He sees his beloved son. And the heavens open and he says, that's my beloved son. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Then he sees what he's been after from the very beginning. Not just, not just people who are saved from hell and go on to raise hell. use such language, saved from hell, but yet they're still raising hell. <clears throat> they're still spreading the other kingdom, you know. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> I wrote down in my notes, do you already flow in the spirit of the kingdom? Um, you are to seek first the kingdom, but it is assured to the little flock or the small and meek ones. Okay, so, <clears throat> so he says... So these words go out, and we're familiar with these words, are we not? We've heard this all the time. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And so we take, what, what spirit do we take that in? Do we take that into, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek Christianity. I'm going to seek to know how to pray for people, or I'm going to seek to you know, be able to go you know, on short-term missions or something, you know, like that. <clears throat> when he's talking about seek to be governed by the spirit of the king, King Jesus. Okay. And that's where the kingdom is. I've said that many times. Where is the kingdom? Anywhere the king reigns. And if he reigns over us and can reign in our selfishness and our bad attitudes and our there is the kingdom praise God you know so the goal is toward Christ the goal is not just you know okay I'll seek the kingdom and God will give me all this good stuff because then he says I mean it's just it's I'm trying to put this into words the way that I, I see it in my mind I see him saying to what we would say, saying to people, his disciples, seek first the kingdom. Okay? Almost like um, you haven't got it yet. So go, man, go. You know? <clears throat> Get after it. Then he turns right around in the next verse. He looks at a bunch of little, little sheep and a little flock and he says, Fear not. It gives the Father good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do you, do you see that? They're both the same, but somehow in our minds we make the first verse, this religious order to Christians, and then this over here, we don't see that this actually is the answer to seek first the kingdom of God. You're already the little flock. You're already of his kingdom. You're already of the kingdom nature. So it's just, it's assured to you. So I I'm, I'm, don't want to labor on this too much, but, you know, if you said it to a group of Christians, seek first, they're liable to start lifting up stuff and looking under the thing. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm trying to find the kingdom, you know. <clears throat> but he says to them, you know, fear not, little flock. The, it gives the Father good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In other words, the kingdom as in sheepfold, the larger one that you're going to en enter into, don't worry about it. It's assured to you. See, So they're not having to look around like, oh, well, how do I get this? They can concentrate on conforming to the image of the Lamb. The one who sits on the throne, the Lamb of God, the slain one. They can conform to that spirit of selflessness. <clears throat> All right. 
And the key there being, you know, that they are small and meek and vulnerable and helpless, but they're not either. Because Jesus, the Lamb of God, and that's what John the Baptist called him, behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God came into this earth and all around him was nothing but self-seeking, self-centered power mongers that were all darkness. And he was the only light and he was the Lamb. He was the Lamb of God. And they ruthlessly treated him and they, you know, they did all of those things to him. But he had nothing to fear because in his loss, you know, like I said, um, he lost the battle to Rome, if you will. I'll just put it like this, that battle of Calvary. He lost the battle to Caesar and won the whole world. He won it not by winning, but by losing. You know, I know people try to paint Jesus with a picture of a sword and him going and beating up the devil and all this stuff. The scripture says, Hebrews 2.14 says that through death he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. There's, I mean, there is written right there. <coughs> it wasn't, you know. Some say, okay, well, he died and he went into hell and there he, he just beat up on the, the devil. The devil wasn't in hell then. I mean, it's not there. And he's not in hell right now. <coughs> I'm just trying to get you to think because I've heard preachers say, yeah, Jesus went out the, into hell and he beat up the devil and all this kind of stuff. Well, the devil wasn't there. I don't know who they think he's beating up, but he's not there. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's go to Luke 13. And ladies, we're actually finishing up tonight. We'll have this class and one more. And then we will have finished our sharing on the four Gospels. Um, and uh, we've been seeing, we've been just going through the scriptures and looking at everywhere where it talks about the kingdom of God and finding the context that's around it. And what we've been finding is that the kingdom of God is, is Christ's nature ruling in us first. And then it'll be a great gathering. So that's kind of how we're, kind of the direction we're going here. All right. <coughs> Luke 13. <coughs> Let's look at verse, um, <coughs> excuse me, 20, 26. <coughs> 26 and 27. Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and have drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not from where you are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. <coughs> all right. So what we're seeing in, the, in particularly verse 26 is we're seeing those who are in proximity to Jesus. All right. So we say, I'm just going to use terminology that I've heard used before. Well, you know, I'm walking with Jesus. Okay. That would mean you're in proximity to Jesus. But in truth, you're not walking with Jesus. Christ is in you. You know, if he's walking, he's walking in you. I mean, we're his body, we're his feet, we're his legs, we're his hands, we're his, you understand what I'm saying? That if Christ is anywhere in this earth, he's in his body. Okay, he's in the church, the body of Christ. And so <clears throat> um, we have to break a mentality of being uh, in proximity to him. Uh, and recognize that he's in us as our life. Now, you know, you could say, well, what about Hebrews where it says, come boldly to the throne of grace? <clears throat> True enough. I mean, he's in us. He's also seated at the right hand of the Father. 
But even in those scriptures, he's trying to get us to enter into the Holy of Holies, enter into something that was heretofore unable to enter into, and that is oneness with him that he accomplished through Calvary. Okay. We're not just close to Jesus. We're one with Jesus. Amen? And that's a good thing. See, Jews were close to him. First covenant. They were close to him. These people are close to him. And look what Jesus says about just being close. He wants, and in fact, uh, well, I'm not sure if we'll get to it or not, but you know that the scripture says the, king, the kingdom of God is within you. Okay. All right. So, uh, they are in proximity to him. They are hearing him. They are seeing many wonderful works. If you take all of the different gospels and you read this particular portion together. And Jesus is saying, uh, let's see, what was it? Verse 27. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not. Look at the wording here. I tell you, I know you not from where you are. Oh, that's different. Do you see it? He's not saying, I don't know you. I never heard of you or whatever. He's saying, I don't know from where you are. Okay, to get that full picture. Um, and then remember now, just a, just a little bit before this, uh, he was talking and he said, Seek first the kingdom of God. Okay. Yeah. So he's telling them, look, I know where you should be from. You should be, you should be from my kingdom. You should have my kingdom in you. But I don't know this place that you're coming from. It is a foreign land. Oh, no, no, I grew up in Israel. I mean, I'm just, most of these people did. I, I'm a Jew. You know, I grew up in Israel. You know, we, he said, we've walked the streets. We've been right there with you. And he's saying, no, I don't know that kingdom that you're from. Now, we'll, we'll show that he spells this out, that this isn't just some random thing, that this is actually the way he begins to spell it out. Um, so look at verse 28 and 29. I mean, we, we read 26, 27. Let's go 28, 29, the very next two in the concept. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. You're, you think you're upset now. <laughs> you're really going to be weeping when... You're not in here, in the fold, in the kingdom, but those who did lay down their lives are, and you, I don't know where you're from, because you're not, you can't be brought into this because it's not in you. Okay, there's more. Um, Let's see. Did I read the verse 29? And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. All right. So what is Jesus' subject when he's talking about this right here? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. And what is the context? The context is that there are those who are saying Oh, Lord, I'm with you, and I know you, and didn't we hang out, and didn't we cast out demons, and didn't we do this, and didn't we mighty wonderful works? And he says, look, I, I don't know from where you are. We might have done that, but your kingdom is, you did that. You, you, you gave words in church that were from me, and 
you know, when people came up afterward and said, oh, that was so wonderful, man, you were going, yeah, you know, you're taking all the glory to yourself. You're thinking you're something when that, that's a, called a gift of the Spirit. You know what I mean? When somebody gives you a gift, you don't go, oh, I deserve this. I mean, it's a gift. You didn't earn it. Well, I mean, you know, you don't earn a gift. And so, so they're, they're of another spirit. Even in the house of God, they're of another spirit. Okay? And so that's why, that's why our hearts have to be after Jesus. We have to have Jesus in the center. Jesus has to be the center. Not gifts, not things, not, not how he uses us, not ministry, not all those things. Because those things can become our little world of circumference. I mean, we can... We can have our, you know, we can be there in the center, and then we've got everything circulating around us. Well, you know, my ministry, and, you know, my friends, and my gifts in church, and, you know, what I do for God. But it's what I do for God. It's not, you know, it's not that spirit of This is Christ in me that lays down his life, that loves, that goes the extra mile, that turns the other cheek. This is all glory to him and none to me because I'm not this way in myself. But I I got saved and I wanted another kingdom in me. I didn't just get saved and automatically you're different because you're not. You know that. Most of us got saved and took us a little while to even realize what we had, you know. And uh, it takes time for God to work these things in us, but, but, but he's not just working godly things. He's conforming us to the image of Christ. When Paul was dealing with the, the Galatians and the problems that they were having, Paul said, I travail in birth till Christ be formed in you. And these, this was the church. This was Christians. They were already Christians. What, well, wait a minute now. What do you mean you're praying for us that Christ will be formed in us? I got Jesus. Yeah, you got him, but he hadn't got you yet. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like Israel when they came out of Egypt. They were, out, they were delivered out of Egypt, but Egypt wasn't out of them yet, was it? And they kept murmuring and complaining and wanting this and wanting God to do that and give us, you know, give us quail and do all this stuff. There is a work, but the work isn't just Christifying us. It's Christ conforming us. It is bringing, we ha- you, you say, Randy, why, why do you make such a big deal out of it? I believe it's the difference between glorifying Christianity and glorifying Christ. You know, I don't, I don't want more Christianity. I want more Jesus. I'll tell you, more Christianity probably won't help me. It'll probably just make me more self-centered and think I'm something or whatever. But Jesus doesn't do that to me. He, you know, like, like John said, you know, he must increase and I must decrease. And when you can finally put that word must in there, then something is finally happening. I must decrease. He must increase. Not I must grow in spiritual things an attitude behind that that's not Christ I mean there is that's not Jesus yet you know well I'm not condi- I'm not condemning that because we all came from there amen all of us came from that it's none righteous but we have to see the contrast of it so that we can know specifically what we're seeking we can say father Form more of Christ in me. Form your son in me. Reveal Christ in me, not just make me better. Because if you must decrease, he's not going to make you better. He's going to make you less. You say, well, I don't think, I don't like your preaching, Randy. Well, he's going to make Jesus more. Are you okay with that? You know? (laughs) I mean... You know, he must increase and I must decrease. It's all one. It's all one spirit, one flow. All right. So also in verse 27, he says, um, I tell you, I know 
I know you not from where you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Now that's a that's an interesting little phrase there because <coughs> the actual um, Greek wording there is you workers of lawlessness. Okay. Well, you know, somebody that's trying to get everybody under the law will go say, you know, say you need to be under the law. You need thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not if Christ is in you, you shall not kill. <laughs> you don't have to follow a commandment. The nature of Christ will see to it that that, you know, as long as there's more him than you. You know, it's like the scale. <laughs> you, know, I don't know, you know, if there's more of you, I don't know, you might. You know, you certainly would steal. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> All right, so what does it mean? You workers of lawlessness is saying you don't, you're not governed by anything. The kingdom of God, right? The nature of Christ. You are ungoverned by the kingdom of God. So you just do what's natural to your fallen nature, to your own lusts or wants or desires. Or In fact, the word lust is really the word just simply desires. It doesn't even necessarily have a sexual connotation. <clears throat> All right, so um, I wrote down, he calls them workers of lawlessness, which means they're not functioning by his kingdom. You're not functioning by my kingdom. You're just random to me. I mean, could you see how that would look random to his nature, to the, to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, that just does, you know. I mean, I've often pictured, and some of you have been around a while and heard this, picture that I got but you know I, I s just sort of saw this picture that we think you know God's going to just you know allow anything into the kingdom we're not talking about salvation we're talking about into the kingdom so the picture that I got was okay so you got all these people who are selfless and self-giving walking streets of gold and you know going through gates of pearl and all this stuff okay and then you have this one person and he got saved, but he gets in there, and he's not governed by that. He's like what he was in the world. So he goes up to somebody and says, hey, man, can I borrow your coat? I'm getting a little cold. And he goes, sure, man, gives him his coat. And they say, here, take my cloak, cloak too. And before too long, you know, this guy has gone around and gathered up everybody's stuff, and he's got it all around him, and he's, cause he's just selfish. And, it, and everybody else is willing to give, and, and God, you know, he's not even going to allow that to start. He wants us conformed to the image of Christ. Are we there yet? Are we totally conformed? No. Do we want more of Jesus? <laughs> Thank God we do. We do. <clears throat> All right. So, and that also gives you a little picture of what I'm talking about with this sheep depending on his nature entering into here. If he still has that lawlessness in here, then he's going to end up with everything because they're all going to give it up and more. You see what I'm saying? So there's a prerequisite. The kingdom has to start being formed in you so that you can enter into this. <clears throat> All right. And again, that's talking about the kingdom of God, not salvation. There is a difference. I'm, I don't want to get into all that because I do it every so often. <clears throat> um, all right. So then in verse 30, see, this is just... Right along the flow here, we've just gone from verse 26 right on down. Now verse 30, behold, there are last who shall be first, and there are first who shall be last. Does that convince you that this is talking about the kingdom of God, the spirit of Christ, the selflessness? There are those who put them first, and God's going to see to it that they're last. Maybe on earth, maybe you can... Put yourself first, and you can step on everybody, and you can, you know, use the backs of people to get you higher and greater and whatever. But it, it's not going to work in the kingdom of God. Okay, so he's so this is the spirit that he's talking about when he's when he's uh, setting all this forth. He's saying, here's a, in a nutshell what I'm speaking of. This is the kingdom of God as opposed to the kingdom of this world. Those who and, and, you know, let's just 
Okay, we can see it with a businessman, how he would put himself first and he steps on everybody and he uses employees and all this stuff. But folks, again, we automatically, without thinking, we na by nature include ourselves in our decisions and how it's going to affect us. We don't even have to run that through our mind. We just go, well, you know, and the, the example I use is, okay, somebody says, well, <clears throat> we really, you know, we really need somebody to, um, to teach the children. <clears throat> and uh, so, um, you know, do I have any volunteers? And nobody raises their hand. So then somebody kind of looks at you, you know, and they go, um, well, how about you? And you go, you know, I just really haven't had much interest in teaching kids. I just, you know, you're weighing that based on your interests and everything. How about let Christ live in you and pour Christ all over those kids? I mean, it's possible. It's possible. You know, we go, I can do all things through Christ. Can you do that? Can you go against what is your preferences? What is easy for you? I mean, you know, because we, you know, we, oh, I'll get involved in with this, this, and this because that's of interest to me. How about this subject over here? No, I could care less about that. I mean, recently I asked Mallory to learn blues on the piano, and uh, she's always been classical. And she's always played, and she's great on the flute and everything, just a tremendous musician and, and um, uh, <coughs> what do you call it, composition, com composer. <coughs> but I threw a curve at her, and she just said, okay, you know, and she just went into it and just said, okay, the Lord's bringing me into a new phase. <coughs> Let me tell you, for a classical flautist to play blues music, is almost like the prodigal son going to the hog pen. <coughs> <laughs> but she willingly has stepped into it in the Lord, and I just appreciate her spirit, and I just think that's a good example of, of stepping outside of what's fun or natural or easy for you. Let's see. Let me just read this then. Then in verse 30, Jesus adds this. <clears throat> the first shall be last and the last shall be first. In God's kingdom, those who put themselves first end up last. So if, if that's the case, then clearly these workers of iniquity put themselves first. Because he says, you're going to look in the kingdom and you're not going to be in there. And you're gonna, there's going to be Wayland and Willie and, oh, sorry, la wrong group. Wailing <coughs> and gnashing of teeth. <coughs> Not really gnashing and wailing gently, sorry. Um, so, um, so clearly these workers of iniquities put themselves first because he said that this is the way this works. And therefore, clearly, they were not of the kingdom. They didn't have the kingdom in them, so they were not going to be brought into the kingdom on a larger sphere. And I put also, but also in his kingdom, those who put themselves lower are made first. Now, you know, <clears throat> I'll close with this. We can we can put ourselves lower because we have a poor self-image, but that's not really what the Lord's looking for. <laughs> Jesus was the Son of God. He was God. And he came down and he put himself lower. And uh, I love that, that scripture in uh, John 13 where, you know, it's after the Lord's Supper and just before Jesus is going to go be crucified. And it says, Jesus, knowing that all things had been given to him of the Father and that he came from the Father and that he goes from the Father, took off his robes, girded himself, and he got down and he washed the disciples' feet. 
Okay, he's not down there going, well, I guess I'm just a nobody, and that's why I'm having to do this. I'm just, uh, you know, and God made me a nobody. No, he's still the son of God. And, and it wasn't a poor self-image thing. Well, I'll take the lower seat, and, you know, everybody else should, should have better than me. I mean, after all, I'm from Mexico. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, oh, sorry, Patty. <laughs> no. No. You're not, you're not, you know, you're not from Mexico. You're from the kingdom of God. I am, we all are, you know. And, you know, I'm from Oak Cliff. That's worse than Mexico. <clears throat> it is true. So, um, you know, it has to be on the basis of Christ. But if it's Christ, then he knows who he is, but he still humbles himself for others, for the sake of others. He still does that because, because it's his nature. But he doesn't do it in some sort of a, you know, I'm yucky or poor me or everybody's better than me or who am I and all this stuff. You know, the, that old who am I, you know. I mean, when I first got saved, I said it to the, Lord, who am I that you would do all this for me? And he said, well, you were Adam. You were the old nature. You were, you know, you were the <laughs> fallen creation. That's who you were. <clears throat> it shut me up, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> I thought I was something special while he died. But in truth, it's because of his great love. And it says that because of his great love wherewith he hath loved us. To Christ be all the glory. All the glory. Amen. All right. Well, I really thought I'd get further than that. <coughs> Yikes. Yeah. And you'll hear it every time. All right. Let's take a little break and we'll come back in about five.